Today's lesson is about meiosis. This is for unit two of the IAL at Excel biology. So we're going to go over the features that result in genetic variation. According to the IAL syllabus, you need to focus on specific stages of meiosis. Not like the way we've done it with mitosis, where we had to talk about every single step. So our main focus is going to be metaphase and prophase one of uh, this type of cell division. Let's start with the significance of meiosis. The main reason why meiosis happens in the first place is that we need to have the same number of chromosomes as our parents. So meiosis' job is to make sure that every generation has the same number of chromosomes, just like their parents. So, for instance, here, uh, those parents are to have this baby. So to make sure that the parents and the offspring all have the 46 chromosomes. Then during meiosis, the number of chromosomes is going to be halved. So chromosome 1 from the mom here goes into this egg cell and another chromosome goes into the sperm of the father. When these gametes, the egg cell and the sperms, fuse during the fertilization process, then we will restore the diploid or the entire 46 number of chromosomes, right? So the main reason why meiosis happens is to make sure that every generation has exactly the same number of chromosomes as its parents. Another reason for meiosis is to provide genetic variation. Genetic variation is essential, as we're going to talk about later on, is essential to ensure survival of species. Now, every person in any organism that reproduces sexually, every person has to have a pair of every each chromosome. Like, we humans got 46 chromosomes, and these chromosomes come in pairs, we receive half of these from our mom and the other half comes from our dads. Now, why these chromosomes are in pairs? Because these chromosomes come in very similar size, very similar distribution of genes. And the only difference between those chromosomes, the only difference here is the type of alleles that are available on these chromosomes. So for instance, in this person, he received a pair of chromosomes for every single feature he has. He has, for instance, received blue eyes from his mom and brown eyes from his dad. So, as you can see, although the genes are identical, they are exactly at the same position. We call that a locus. However, he received different alleles for this gene. Same would apply for the hair type, same would apply for blood groups. As you can see, these chromosomes, we usually call them the homologous chromosomes, those homologous chromosomes are similar in many ways. And the only difference we have here is in terms of their alleles. So the alleles could be different, but nonetheless, homologous chromosomes are quite very similar. So let's take a look again at the definition of homologous chromosomes. They are a pair of matching chromosomes. They're not identical because... Each one of these may have different alleles, and the position of those alleles has always to be at the same location or the same locus. Now, just like what we've done in mitosis, we're going to look at the events of cell cycle in preparation for meiosis. So as you can see, I have four stages. I have G1, S, and G2. Just like we've done with mitosis, the combination of G1, S, and G2 is what we call the interphase, all right? Now, during interphase, interphase is like a preparation for meiosis. So first thing is G1. G1 is the time when the cell grows in size, all right? It makes new proteins, it makes organelles. And as it gets to the S phase, now it's time to do the DNA replication. So as you can see here, I have a pair of homologous chromosomes. 
and we're gonna do what here? We're gonna replicate each one of those chromosomes. So now every chromosome is made up of two sister chromatids. So I still have that exact number of chromosomes. If this was like a full human cell, this would still be 46 chromosomes. But nonetheless, every chromosome is now duplicated and every chromosome is made up of a pair of sister chromatids. What's gonna happen next? We're gonna enter G2. During G2, the cell continues what is started in G1. So it's gonna increase in size further. It's gonna make more proteins and it's gonna make more organelles until the time where it enters what we call the meiosis. During meiosis, what's gonna happen here is gonna, we're gonna split that cell into four haploid cells. Each one of those haploid cells would be called a gamete. It could be a sperm or could be an egg. Now I want you to take a look and compare the cell that we started with to the cell that we end up with. So we started with this cell in G1, and now by the end of this cell cycle, we will end up with four cells that are haploid. These cells are all known as gametes. So I had a pair of homologous chromosomes here, and now what do I have? I have four gametes, each has one of these homologous chromosomes. So we're going to now talk in details how does this thing happen? How do we turn from a diploid cell here to haploid gametes by the end of meiosis? To understand what really happens, we need to take a look at what happens in terms of DNA content. So look what I'm going to do here. I'm going to compare the DNA content per cell during the entire stages of the cell cycle. So the cell cycle is like G1, then I have S, G2, and then I have meiosis. We're gonna have two meiotic divisions. Instead of one division, like the way we've done it with mitosis, we're gonna have two meiotic divisions. So we're gonna call the first meiosis one, I'm gonna call it M1 here, and we're gonna call the second one meiosis two. So let's start with G1. Cells in G1 are diploid. Each chromosome is still one copy, so we don't have those sister chromatids yet. As we get to the S phase, we do the DNA replication, and now each chromosome is made up of two sister chromatids. As we get to G2, the cell is not gonna change its DNA content, it's just like the cytoplasm and the proteins are increasing. Same thing would apply for meiosis one. So, during meiosis 1, there's not much change in terms of the content or the DNA content of the cell. Right at the end of meiosis 1, we call that cytokinesis, we're going to separate those homologous chromosomes. So the first event of meiosis 1, or the whole purpose of meiosis 1, is to separate the homologous chromosomes. So now what do I have? I have two cells. Each one has one of those homologous chromosomes. Meiosis is not over. This is just like a transition until we get to meiosis 2. And what's going to happen in meiosis 2? Do you see those sister chromatids in each chromosome? We're going to separate each and every one of those sister chromatids in order to produce, in order to produce four haploid sperms, or four haploid gametes in general, by the end of the process of uh, meiosis, right? So as you can see, the DNA content increases, but then we split it until we get to half to what we've started with. As we stated at the beginning of the class, we said one reason or one purpose of meiosis is to lead to variation. So right here, I have a pair of homologous chromosomes, and I want to show you one reason behind that genetic variation that meiosis results with. Now, homologous chromosomes very early in meiosis 1, during the stage known as prophase 1, now we call them prophase 1 or prophase 2 because each stage is going to be repeated twice. Since we have two cell divisions or two meiotic divisions, we're going to repeat each st stage twice. So during prophase 1, the homologous chromosomes start first to pair up, so each one of those 
pair up like this in a process known as the synapses. So the synapses is something unique to meiosis where the chromosome, the homologous chromosomes, go parallel just like this. And then they start to do what we call a crossing over. Crossing over occurs between the non-sister chromatids of each one of those homologous chromosomes. So those two here are known as uh, sister chromatids. And so are the yellow ones are known as sister chromatids. But the crossing over is going to occur between the two non-sister chromatids of these homologous chromosomes. Now, what happens during that crossing over? Since the DNA is quite similar between those two chromosomes, then it's possible to start cutting fragments of DNA and share it among these homologous chromosomes. So think of it as if these chromosomes are swapping bits and pieces of DNA among one another. So by the end of this, you'll end up with patches or fragments of DNA that's been swapped between these chromosomes. Now, you may ask yourself, what's the purpose of this? Why we're doing this? Or what's the reason behind the crossing over? The main reason here is because this would allow the DNA to be rearranged among those homologous chromosomes. So as you can see here, I have alleles, different alleles of different genes, and they are arranged originally in that form. So I have recessive for A and D, and I have a dominant B. Opposite is for the other homologous chromosome. By the end of this crossing over, we swap pieces of DNA among those chromosomes, and then we end up with different arrangement. So as you can see now, I have four chromatids, and each chromatid has a unique set of alleles that wasn't available before. If you think of 46 chromosomes, then you realize that there will be so much variation and there wouldn't be any way that a sperm or an egg cell will be identical to one another. So once again, the whole purpose of this crossing over is to rearrange the allele and produce some unique combinations that wasn't available in the parents. It's quite important to understand the terminology behind that crossing over. So you'll be asked quite often about the that we have here. So first one is you have to make sure that you understand that the crossing over occurs between what we call non-sister chromatids. Another feature is that once the non-sister chromatids cross over, they form like an X-shaped structure. This is known as the chiasmata. So chiasmata is that unique structure that could be visible with the microscope once these chromosomes cross over. By the end of the process, as you can see, I end up with unique rearrangement of the alleles. So let's take a look again at these events or these structures that result during the crosses over. So first thing is the synapses. The synapses is when the chromosomes pair up during prophase one. Then we got that structure, the X-shaped structure known as the chiasmata. And then we have a term to describe those four chromatids. Now, four in general, we call that tetra. So they came up with this term of tetrad to refer to the four sister chromatids that form during the crossing over event. In some textbooks or some mark schemes, they also refer to it as the bivalent. So whether it is a tetrad or a bivalent, it would always refer to the same arrangement of four sister chromatids. Let's go over these structures once again so we make sure that we understand what each one of them means. So if you could pause the screen and try to match those structures to their name and then I can show you how is it going to be done. So first structure is the X-shaped structure right here. That's where the crossing over occurs and that's going to be called the chiasmata. Then I have two identical sister chromatids, simply we call them the sister chromatids. Those belong to the same chromosome. On the other hand, the chromatids where the crossing over takes place, right here, those are known as the non-sister chromatids. Following this, I have the what I call the tetrad, which is the four chromatids, 
also known as the bivalent. So both terms describe exactly the same structures. I want to show you some possible questions on how you'll be asked about crossing over. So in one exam paper, we were given a pair of homologous chromosomes, and then we were asked to sketch how or the product of the crossing over. So as you can see, the crossover happened between those two non-sister chromatids. So the outcome is going to be like this. You're going to have shaded area here where the crossing over has happened because those two DNA pieces got swapped. And the entire chromosome would be blank because there was no crossing over happening here. Opposite would apply for the other chromosome here. So it would be still the same, shaded all the way, except that top right corner where the crossing over has happened. Another example is this one here. We were given a pair of homologous chromosomes, but this time they gave us the alleles. And just like last time, the crossover happened here. So basically all what I need to do is to copy those uh, alleles. I'm not going to change anything about those uh, chromatids on the flanks. The only difference is going to be for the A capiton and A small. So do, I'm going to swap those two alleles. So this will be here and the A capital will be on the right. And we keep everything the way it was before the crossover. Now, in some cases, especially in humans, their alleles or their genes are very close. In humans, the allele or the gene for ginger hair and for freckles are very close. They are found on the same chromosome and they're very close to one another. So as you can see, uh, let's say A capitals for the hair color and B is for the freckles. I put them on the same chromosome and I put them very close. That's because those genes, when the genes are very close to one another, they will always be inherited like a package or they'll be called like linked gene. So again, think of crossing over as if it's like a random cut-in process. The cut is more likely to occur between B and C simply because the distance between B and C is greater than the distance between A and B. So that reason, the chance of a crossover or the chance for separating A and B is going to be less likely than the chance of separating B and C. So the conclusion here if the genes are closed, sorry, if the genes are close, then the chance of crossing over is less likely. And for that reason, we're going to call them linked genes. And they're always going to be inherited or very likely to be inherited as if they were like a single uh, gene. In this example, they gave us the frequency of crossing over and they want us to arrange those genes on one chromosome. Remember what we just said? We said that the frequency of crossing over is more likely if the genes are further apart. So based on this fact, if the frequency is bigger, like between A and B, then they will be further apart on the same chromosome. So I was asked to, for three marks, I was asked to arrange those genes based on that fact. So I'm going to put a and B, 10 steps away, just like what the question says. So I'm just going to put it right here. And I'm going to put A and D, three steps away. So there we go. So I'm just going to put one, two, three. And that's where D is supposed to be. Just to make sure that we're doing the right work, if you measure the distance between B and D, it's going to have to be seven. And that's exactly what we have there. I still have to place C, but... I have a problem because C compared to B could be two steps away, right? So it could place C on the left or on the right. Then you're going to have to use another evidence, which is C and D. C and D are like nine steps away, right? For that reason, since it's nine, then you're going to have to be placed on the right side of B, right? So... Uh, 
we decided to do all the work based on the heading here. And as we said earlier, the further apart, the more likely for a crossing over to happen. We're now going to look at another important event that takes place in the first stage of meiosis or meiosis number one. So other than crossing over, we have another process that is also responsible for variation. This takes place during meiosis, during metaphase one of meiosis. So metaphase one, uh, that's just like following prophase. During metaphase, chromosomes line up right in the middle or in the equator of the cell. And as you can see, the lining up here would result in what? It would result in the separation of those homologous chromosomes. So during metaphase, we'll line them up in the middle the way they are now. Following that, in anaphase, those homologous chromosomes would separate. So one of the homologous chromosomes goes to the first cell, and the other one is going to go to the other cell. Same would apply for the other pair of homologous chromosomes. Now, metaphase 1 and anaphase 1 would result in what we call independent assortment. What does it mean when I say independent assortment? This refers to the fact that the lining up in metaphase would result in many different variations. So in my first case, I had the red and green in the same cell, right? But I can have another arrangement. For instance, if the arrangement went like this and I've had the red and the yellow on one side of the cell, green and blue on the other side of the cell, so during metaphase one, the arrangement could be in many different combinations. Then I will have what? Then I will have the yellow and red in one cell, green and blue in the other. So as you can see now, the cells that I've produced in the first case here are different than the cells I've produced in the other case. Now, you may find that this is just giving me two possible outcomes. But meiosis occurs among 46 chromosomes. So you have to think that the possible outcome is going to be far greater than what I have here. Just like for simplicity, I just put two pairs of homologous chromosomes. But the reality is we will have so many different combinations. So again, during metaphase one, we have an important event that also adds to what we call variation, genetic variation, which is the random combination of chromosomes. So the way chromosomes line up during metaphase would result in many different cells, and that would cause a lot of variation. So, so far we've mentioned two causes of variation. One was crossing over, where we arrange the alleles, but now I am having different combinations of maternal and paternal chromosomes. Now, I'm going to skip several events in meiosis simply because we're not required to learn more about them. And I'm going to refer to anaphase 2. So we went in meiosis 1, and we've learned about the two significant events. And now I want to show you what really happens in anaphase 2. During anaphase 2, the chromosomes that we've made during what we call uh, the meiosis 1 are now going to be separated into sister chromatids. So this is the product of meiosis 1. It's going to be chromosomes like this one with two sister chromatids. And as you can see, crossing over has already happened here. So the chromosomes will line up during metaphase 2, which is the way they are here. And following this, you'll find that the sister chromatids would start to separate. So as you can see here, those would separate. Each will go to one of the gametes. And same thing would apply for the other homologous chromosome here. It would separate into what we call two sister chromatids. I'm not going to call them chromatids anymore because they're now considered each as a chromosome. So take a look at the outcome that I have here. I have four haploid gametes 
each has half the number of chromosomes that I've started with. And each gamete basically has a unique set of alleles due to the crossing over happening between these chromosomes and no crossing over happening between the other chromosomes. All right? So again, uh, homologous chromosomes separate in anaphase 1. You have to keep this in mind that chromosomes separate in anaphase 1, so the homologous chromosomes, but during anaphase 2, what we separate is no longer the chromosomes, we actually separate the actual sister chromatids. So it's like this meiosis 2 is more like mitosis, where we separate the chromatids during anaphase. But meiosis 1 is quite unique because we don't separate chromatids, we actually separate the chromosomes. I want to show you a quick review to what we've done so far. So, so far we went from interphase, G1, S, and G2, into meiosis 1. Early during prophase 1, we've done a unique event. There was a unique event there where chromosomes started to pair up, preparing for what we call the crossing over. And the crossing over took place to rearrange the alleles. Following this, these chromosomes started to line up in the middle. The way they lined up during metaphase one caused a lot of different variations. We call this event the independent assortment. The homologous chromosomes got separated and then we formed two cells. These two cells will straight away enter what we call meiosis two and we will separate the sister chromatids during what we call anaphase two. And that will give rise to what? That will give rise to what we call four haploid gametes. I want to review the important events that we went through from the time we started in interphase, where we had DNA replication, S phase. In meiosis one, we had some important events most importantly was crossing over. It started with the pairing up of the homologous chromosomes. We call this the synapses, uh, following, followed by what we call crossing over. And this resulted in what we call the recombination of the alleles. Another important event that took place in metaphase one was the independent assortment. Now, only in meiosis 2, we separate the sister chromatids that takes place in anaphase 2, and that results in the formation of four haploid gametes. Here I want to differentiate between meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 because students always have problems to identify when does each event happen. So remember, the synapses or the pairing up of chromosomes took place in Prophase 1, we did have cytokinesis, which is the division of the cytoplasm, that takes place in either stages of meiosis. So crossing over was a unique event for meiosis 1, including independent assortment was also occurring in meiosis 1. So as you can see, the majority of the events that make meiosis significant basically take place in the first division. Now, separation of the sister chromatids took place in meiosis 2, while the separation of the homologous chromosomes took place in meiosis 1. This question came in an exam paper for four marks, and we were required to differentiate between the two stages of meiosis. So first question they're saying, or the first statement they're saying here, pairing of homologous chromosomes. That's what we refer to as the synapses, and that took place only in meiosis 1. Here it says each chromosome consists of a pair of chromatids. Now here you have to be careful, because chromosomes looking like pairs of sister chromatids, this happened actually during prophase 1. So prophase 1, the chromosomes looked like this, and even in prophase 2, the chromosomes still looking made up of sister chromatids. We don't separate the sister chromatids 
until we get to anaphase 2. So for that reason, chromosomes made up of sister chromatids during prophase, that would be applicable for both types of meiosis. As we said several times, crossing over is in the first division, and independent assortment is also in the first division. Right now, I want to make a comparison between meiosis and mitosis. So mitosis is what we took in the previous lesson, and meiosis is the one we're talking about right now. So if you could pause the screen and try to differentiate between those two divisions, and then we can do it together. So, only meiosis is made up of two divisions. DNA replication, or the S phase, takes place in before any type of cell division, so that's a common feature. Only meiosis results in genetic variation, while mitosis produces identical cells. Independent assortment is for meiosis. Two identical diploid cells, that's what mitosis aims for. We also separate sister chromatids in mitosis and even in meiosis number two, so that's another common feature. Pairing up of homologous chromosomes, that's in prophase one of meiosis. And separation of homologous chromosomes also is a unique feature of meiosis that takes place during anaphase one. So we're going to make a summary of what we've done today about meiosis. So... First thing, during of meiosis, chromosomes pair up. So I'm going to define or identify the stage where this happens. This happens in prophase 1. This pairing up of chromosomes is known as the basically the synapses. Fragments of non-sister chromatids are exchanged. This process is known as the crossing over. So that would be an ideal way of being asked to describe crossing over, that would be the way you would be writing this event. Uh, so crossing over, which leads to what we call the recombination of the alleles. A structure known as is visible in the microscope. So they're referring here to the X-shaped structure during crossing over, known as the chiasmata. Um, during homologous chromosomes line up randomly, so they're referring here to the lining up of homologous chromosomes during metaphase one. Each of the chromosomes has the freedom to go to each pole of the cell. During meiosis, sister chromatids separate. So you now I want to refer to where exactly the separation of chromatids happen. That takes place during anaphase two. This results in the formation of what we call uh, haploid gametes, each with a unique set. Now, do I choose genes or alleles? I'm only allowed to use the word alleles here because all sperms or eggs will have the same genes. The only difference is going to be in terms of their alleles. For the second part of this lesson, we're going to be working on the process of fertilization. So according to the Unit 2 syllabus, we're supposed to first learn about the gametes, the sperms and the eggs. And then we're going to look at the fertilization process in mammals, just like the ones you have in humans. And finally, we'll look at fertilization in flowering plants. So first thing, we're going to look at the sperm, the gametes, the male gametes in humans. The male gamete in humans or mammals in general, first it contains a haploid nucleus. That's the product of meiosis. It also contains in its head, it contains a vesicle. This vesicle in the head of the sperm contains a what we call the acrosome, which contains hydrolytic enzymes. These hydrolytic enzymes would prove to be very helpful during fertilization. So the acrosome contains what we call the hydrolytic enzymes called acrosin. This acrosin is required to digest the jelly layer around the egg cell. In the middle part of the sperm, we got plenty of mitochondria because those mitochondria are required for the movement of the tail or the flagellum, right? So again, the sperm as a whole could be divided into three sections. There is a head, 
That's where the acrosome and the haploid nucleus is. The middle part, that's where the majority of the mitochondria are, and the flagellum, which is required for the movement of the sperm. The sperm contains minimum amount of cytoplasm simply because it's required to swim a long distance, and that swim first would require energy from the mitochondria, and it would also require the sperm to be light in weight. Moving now to the X cell or the ovum, the X cell contains, just like the sperm, contains a haploid nucleus. It contains mitochondria, just like any other animal cell. It contains plenty of cytoplasm, unlike the sperm. The egg cell is quite very large. It's actually the largest human cell. And it's required to store nutrients for the early stages of the life of the embryo. Other than this, we got that jelly coating, or we call it zona pellucida, that's found right around the egg cell. And we got vesicles. Those vesicles, we call them the cortical granules. Now, the cortical granules and zolipodicida, they are quite very important for the process of fertilization, just like what we're going to see in just a couple of moments. So, the egg cell's purpose, or the purpose of the egg cell being large and containing the jelly layer, first, large to store nutrients, the zona pellucida and the cortical granules they are important to prevent the entry of more than one sperm. So these are like the main adaptations that the egg cell have. In this question, we've been asked to find the magnification of an image. We've been given like this image of a sperm cell. And we've been asked to find the magnification. The only issue we have here is that the image has been given, right? But I wasn't given like the actual size of the sperm. However, we've been given here the scale of this image. So what we usually have to do here is just take your ruler and match the scale you've been given on this image to the size of your ruler. So in my case, the scale of my ruler is 4 centimeters or 40 millimeters. And that's on the image here is 60 micrometers. I need now to do what? I need to convert those units for me to divide now. Those units have to be matching. So what am I going to do here? I'm going to divide that 40 millimeter, which is going to convert it to micrometers. So to convert millimeters to micrometers, I'm going to have to multiply by 1,000. So this becomes like 40,000 divided by 60. So this is going to be like 40,000 divided by 60, and the answer is going to be 666.7. That's a magnification, so I put that small x before my number. We're now going to compare between the structure of a sperm cell and the structure of an egg cell. So first thing to do here is like pause the screen and try to differentiate, and then check your answer. So first thing is motility. Motility is another way of saying mobility or motion, and that would only apply for sperms. Both cells are haploids. Only sperms contain the acrosin to digest the jelly coating around the egg cell. Sperms are streamlined to minimize friction while swimming to the egg cell. Mitochondria are found in both cells, although like you have plenty of mitochondria and sperms, but the egg cell still contains plenty of mitochondria. Zona pellucida, or the jelly layer, is the one found around the egg cell. Cytoplasm in the egg cell is more than that in the sperm because the cytoplasm in the egg cell is to store food for the early life of the embryo. Cortical granules, those are found in the egg cell. And obviously the egg cell is way larger than the sperm. So like you compare the size of an egg cell to a sperm, it would be way, way bigger than those sperm cells. In this question, we're going to differentiate. Like they gave me statements here, and they want me to use those statements to differentiate between a sperm and an egg cell. So first thing is site containing acrosin. 
that would be found only in the sperm. That's part C. That's the acrosome, actually. Site where acrosin works, that would be the jelly layer. So that would be this layer, F. Site containing haploid number of chromosomes. So it would be any nucleus. Could be the egg or the sperm, but I was only given the sperm here. Finally, site containing mitochondria. Then I have to refer to the cytoplasm, either of the egg or of the sperm. Ideally, it would have been here in the middle part of the sperm, but I wasn't given this option. So I'm just going to pick the cytoplasm of the egg cell. So that would be letter G. We're now going to look at the process of fertilization. So as we said, we're going to start this in mammals and they're going to do it in flowering plants. So in mammals, the sperm, the sperm that first approaches the egg cell starts to release the enzyme acrosin. This acrosin would digest the jelly layer around the egg here. And as it gets digested, that would allow like an easy passage for the sperm to get to the egg cell. Right at this moment, the egg cell and the sperm recognize, we call this species recognition, just to make sure that the sperm and egg belong to the same species. And following this, the membrane of the sperm and the membrane of the egg cell would start to fuse, right? At this moment of fusion of the membranes, those cortical granules in the egg cell will move to the surface and they will start to release their content. They contain like digestive enzymes and they change the composition of that zona pellucida or the jelly layer. So as you can see, the jelly layer would now start to look different. It would no longer be like jelly-like structure. It would be more of hard membrane. We usually call this the fertilization membrane. So the fertilization membrane would now do what? Would now prevent any other sperm from getting into the egg cell. And that's what we call polyspermy. So polyspermy is the fact that only one sperm can get into the egg and all of the other sperms would just be locked uh, outside. All right? So again, the cortical granule reaction, that's when the vesicles or the cortical granules release enzymes that harden the jelly layer, causing the formation of a fertilization membrane, which is essential to prevent many sperms from getting into the egg right? Um, right after this event, we will have the egg cell, the sperm nucleus, and the egg cell nucleus fusing with one another. So that's what we call here. We call that this is fertilization. So again, the nucleus of the sperm and the nucleus of the egg cell here will fuse up, and that would result in the formation of a zygote or a fertilized egg. So let's review this one more time. So the very first thing that happens here is that the sperm approaches that jelly layer and releases content. The content is known as acrosin. The acrosin digests that jelly layer. And following this, we have the receptors from both sperms and egg recognizing each other. That's what we call species recognition ensuring that they belong to the same species. The membranes fuse up. This will be followed by the cortical granule reaction. The cortical granule release their contents of enzymes, leading to the hardening of the jelly layer or the zona pellucida. Now we have the fertilization membrane shown here in green or in blue, and that would prevent the entry of any other sperm. This would be followed by the process of fertilization, like the fusion of the nuclei of the sperm and the egg cell. We're now going to arrange those events based on what we've just said. So we're going to try to arrange the process of fertilization in mammals, starting with the very first event. The very first event here is when the acrosin, the enzyme that uh, gets released, so the acrosome, releases its content here by exocytosis, and acrosin starts to digest the jelly layer. Following this, we're going to have the species recognition with the receptors, leading to the fusion of 
the membranes. When the membranes fuse, you will have the cortical granule reactions, leading to the formation of the fertilization membrane, and that would eventually end up with the actual fertilization event of the fusion of the two nuclei. In this question, they asked us for four marks to describe the process of fertilization in mammals. So first thing is the membrane of the sperm fuses with the membrane of the egg cell, all right? And then we're going to describe the cortical granule reaction. So I'm going to say here cortical granules, all right? This would release their contents by the process of exocytosis, all right? Contents of the cortical granules now combine with the zona pellucida, the jelly coating, and that would cause what? That would cause it to harden, all right? We call these events leading to the formation of the fertilization membrane, we call it the cortical granule reaction. So cortical granule reaction. This results in the formation of the fertilization membrane. Fertilization membrane. So notice we did not mention the acrosome reaction. Reason is because the question is asking me to describe the events following the acrosome reaction. It would have been a waste of time to describe it if I wasn't asked about it. We're now going to do the same thing, fertilization, but this time we're going to do fertilization in flowering plants. Notice that these events start with pollination. So the pollen grain lands on the stigma here and it starts to form what we call a pollen tube. So again, fertilization in plants starts with a pollen grain landing on stigma. The pollen grain germinates, forming like a tube, and that tube would carry the nuclei of the pollen grain all the way to the egg cell inside the ovule. So first thing happens is inside the ovary. So the ovary, which is like the bottom part here of the female organs, uh, the ovary starts to produce what we call the embryo sac. Like every ovary contains what we call an ovule. The ovule contains a haploid nucleus, which divides by mitosis to form two more haploid nuclei. So notice the original nucleus here was a product of meiosis. That's why it's haploid. But when it divides further by mitosis, it forms two haploid nuclei, then one more mitotic division and forming four haploid nuclei. And the last event would be the formation of eight haploid nuclei. I will no longer call this an ovule. From now onwards, we're going to call this an embryo sac. Same thing or something similar occurs in the male pollen grain. In the pollen grain, we divide that haploid nucleus again by mitosis, but we're only going to divide it once here to form two nuclei. One of those nuclei, we're going to call it the generative nucleus. That's the one that would divide later on to form two male gametes. Still, everything here is haploid. The other nucleus we have here is known as the pollen tube nucleus. That's the nucleus that contains like the genetic information required to form enzymes. And those enzymes would be responsible for the digestion of the tissues, of the style, the ovary, all the way until that pollen tube gets into the embryo sac. So once again, the first event happens here in the ovary. So we get, as we said, we're going to get eight haploid nuclei three on the top end, another three here near the opening. We're going to call this opening here, we call it the micropile, all right? Now, those nuclei near the bottom contain what we call the egg cell. So this is, you have to know it by its location. That's what we call the actual egg cell. In the center of the embryo sac, we got also two nuclei. Those nuclei are also quite important and we call those nuclei, we call them the polar nuclei. Now let's go back to the top, to the pollen grain. In the pollen grain, we're going to divide that nucleus. We said we're going to divide it into two nuclei first. Each is haploid. 
One of those nuclei would be the pollen tube nucleus. That's the one that would form the pollen tube. So we're going to get a pollen tube going all the way down like this until we get to the micropyle. Who's going to guide this? It's guided by the pollen tube nucleus. So that pollen tube nucleus would form enzymes, has DNA to form enzymes. And then once this pollen tube forms that pollen tube, actually, uh, it would just degenerate. Up there, we have what we call the generative nucleus, which divides by mitosis, and it forms two haploid male gametes. One of these would fuse with the egg cell, and one would fuse with the polar nuclei in the middle of the embryo sac. So now we're going to have what we call the double fertilization. First fertilization is going to be between the egg cell and the first male nucleus here. The second would be between three nuclei, two belong to the female and one belong to the male, and that would result in the formation of what we call an endosperm. So an endosperm is basically a tissue made up of three nuclei. That's why this is what we call a triploid. It's not like haploid anymore. It's not even diploid. It's a triploid because it's made up of three nuclei while the zygote that results here would be simply diploid. So once again, double fertilization is what happens there in the embryo sac. You get a male gamete fusing with an egg cell to form a zygote. This would result in the formation of an embryo. That's what you usually find inside the seed. And we got also a male gamete fusing with the two polar nuclei in the middle of the embryo sac, and that would form an endosperm. The endosperm is the tissue we'd find inside the seed, and that's responsible, that would be responsible for like providing nutrients for the embryo. So just like what we've done with the mammals, we're going to arrange the events for the fertilization in flowering plants. So once again, the very first thing that happens is that we're going to form the pollen tube. So the pollen tube nucleus here would be formed, and that would be guided by the pollen tube nucleus. This pollen tube nucleus would form enzymes, and those enzymes will lead the pollen tube all the way until it enters the embryo sac through the micropyle. One male gamete causes the formation of the fertilized egg or the zygote, while the other male gametes would form the endosperm. A zygote now grows into an embryo, and that embryo would be feeding on the endosperm. In this last question, we're going to look at the events for fertilization in flowering plants. So first one is the male generative nucleus divides by mitosis to produce two haploid male gametes. Those haploid male gametes would cause the double fertilization. But before this, that grows down the style until it enters. So I'm going to refer to the pollen tube. And it enters what? It's going to enter the embryo sac, where what we call double fertilization happens. One male gamete fuses with the egg cell, and that would form a zygote or fertilized egg. Another male gamete fuses with the two polar nuclei to produce what? We're going to now produce what we call the endosperm. And this endosperm uh, is actually triploid. So I'm just going to say triploid uh, tissue known as the endosperm. Now that we're done with the lesson, the best thing you could do is to start solving the classified papers. You can always check the answers with the provided answer there. And once you're done with the solving part, it would be highly recommended if you take a quiz. So you have like multiple choice all taken from actual exam papers, and those would help you to check your...